basically what's happening is you're at a conference where you're talking about a lot of digital life, and you're doing a lot of AI, and you're talking a lot about computing, and you're talking about Dubai electronics, et cetera, and it's also important to keep an eye on how life is transitioning. And let's put that in the context of Dustin Hoffman. So this is a very young Dustin Hoffman. He made the movie The Graduate. There are two iconic scenes in The Graduate. There is the seduction scene. I'm not going to talk about that. There is a second scene where he talks about the advice he got from an old man. So the old man takes him out by the swimming pool, puts his arm around him, and tells him one word, just one word. And of course, that word was plastics. And it was completely wrong. And it was completely wrong because the word should have been silicon. And the reason it should have been silicon is because the greatest wealth creation on Earth was just about to take place. So this movie is released in 1967. And already, Fairchild is making semiconductors and selling semiconductors. And the year after this movie is released, Intel is founded. So all of a sudden, you get this enormous digital revolution, and everybody was talking about plastics. And the thing you should think about is, as you're talking about the digital world, which is certainly important and will remain important for the next 30 or 40 years, you should also be thinking about the life world. So if you were to hear a word today, that word should be very carefully thought through. Because, unfortunately, Dustin Hoffman did not end up on stage with these two nice men. Unfortunately, he ended up being a Tupperware salesman because he had the wrong advice. So here, the one word should probably be life code. And as you're thinking about life code, what you should be thinking of is every creature on Earth until last year was made of four base pairs of DNA. So every mosquito, every plant, every orange, every sheep, every human being was made of these four base pairs. As of last year, you can swap out two of these base pairs, and you can make creatures with XY instead of AT. And what that means is you suddenly create a parallel evolutionary track, which potentially can make viruses or plants or animals that mate with nothing on Earth, that evolve on a completely parallel structure. That means that you can build not with 20 amino acids, but you can build with 172 amino acids. So your building blocks for life just increased on a massive scale. And as you're thinking of those structures, what it basically means is the argument is that life turns out to be code. And so in the same way as you code with ABCs, in the same way as you code with ones and zeros, you code with life. And if you code with life, then you write sentences with life. And as you've been seeing in the CRISPR talks or in the evolution talks, or in the biochemistry talks, or in the biotech talks. In essence, what that means is you can rewrite sentences of life. And if you can rewrite sentences of life, then you can build great big coding centers in the same way as you built great big libraries in Alexandria, or you built great big libraries in Cordoba, or you built great big libraries in Baghdad, or you built great big libraries in Silicon Valley. It's just a different language. And as you build these great big languages, those places that build these languages and build these libraries are going to drive the global economy much in the same way as you had a transition from ones and zeros into today's world. And that's completely changed biology, right? Because if you think of biology and how it was practiced, oh, 30 years ago, you had a whole series of biologists with microscopes, you had a whole series of biologists with little Pith helmets looking around for plants, looking at barnacles, looking at fishes. So they were observing stuff. They were cataloging stuff. And biology was basically reactive, right? It's how does a plant grow? How is this a different species? And, and they were observing stuff. It was almost an outgrowth of Linnaeus or an outgrowth of Darwin observing a process. And what's happening today is the new biology is proactive. It's not what can I observe, it's what can I make. And when you make things that are alive, that changes the rules of the game in an absolutely fundamental way because science used to be about discovering and now it's about creating. So you're writing the sentences, you're not reading them. And in the measure that that happens, what it does is it's flipped evolution completely on its head. 
because for four billion years what happened was it was basically natural selection. Are you prettier? Are you faster? Are you more colorful? Do you smell better? All the reasons why you would have children that have children that have children. And the other thing that would happen is you'd have these random mutations. So you, blue eyes, 10,000 years old, originate near the blue sea, near the black sea. Right? Really recent mutation. But it turns out a lot of people like blue eyes. So blue eyes start to reproduce. It's attractive to some people. And so as you're thinking about that structure, now what we're doing is we're entering a world of unnatural selection and non-random mutation. And that's a completely different logic, right? Because what you're doing is you're saying, instead of letting nature survive what lives here, I'm going to select what lives here. And the only thing you've got to do is you've got to just walk around this hotel compound, right? Leave this hotel compound for 10 years, don't touch it. Very few of the things that are in here are going to still grow here in 10 years. The grass is not going to be there. The same birds are not going to be there. There's going to be very different kinds of animals. And so as you think of that structure, natural selection has been wolves. We took wolves, we put them into houses, we bred them for a few thousand years, and we got things that look like this. And that is completely unnatural selection. So when you watch these little doggies that are inside the Hermes bags down here on the corniche, those aren't natural doggies, right? Those, those are unnaturally selected because they have to fit inside an Hermes bag and because we want them to fit in top our laps. But if you leave that dog on the African plane for about five minutes, it's going to be naturally selected very quickly. <laughs> right? And, and so there are consequences to this because we laugh about dogs, but then we take our kids out to see plantations of palm trees. That's not natural selection. A cornfield is not natural selection. A wheat field is not natural selection. Right? Cornfields do not appear naturally in nature. You don't walk through the Amazon forest and absent human beings find one set of plants growing in orderly rows. In fact, corn doesn't reproduce unless if humans reproduce it today. So when you think about half of life on Earth, half of life on Earth is what we choose to live and die. It's not nature choosing it. We're saying, I'd like this here, I'd like this here, I'd like this here. That creates a completely parallel evolutionary logic where what lives in a desert that's untouched looks like this, and what lives in a desert that's cultivated looks like this. And those are different creatures, right? So we've been doing this for a long time. We took mustard wheat. And mustard wheat, if you suppress the flowers, you get broccoli. If you get bigger leaves, then you get kale. If you sterilize them, then you get cauliflower. Think about that one next time you go to an organic market. So basically what we're doing is we're playing with life code and saying, I like this taste, I like this color, I like this to grow this way. I want this to be salt tolerant, I want this to be drought tolerant, I want this or I want that. And, and that's a very different logic, right? I want my date palms to be sweeter. I want them to grow at this height so they're easier to pick. I want them to have more oil. That, that is a very deliberate writing of sentences of life to our purposes. The difference is that now we're beginning to do it in a much faster way. So our ways of editing, our ability to edit, is growing very quickly. So these instruments like CRISPR, these instruments like whole genome sequencing, these instruments like assembling genomes, are simply allowing us in real time to edit life on a grand scale. And, and just to give you an order of magnitude, this has all happened since I came and spoke at the strategy forum here for the first time. So in the same way as Dubai has grown into this massive hub, and the airline has grown massive, and the skyscrapers have grown massive, and the infrastructure has grown massive, over that same period of time, we've moved from not having a human genome to building full genomes. And the same kind of growth that you see in Dubai has occurred in biology at about the same pace. 
So if you're surprised that this week there's four more skyscrapers, there's four more instruments that at life. There's four more ways of building CRISPRs. There's four more ways of doing X, Y, and Z. And that's gonna change the global economy because we're entering a period where we can do this on a very rapid basis. So I founded a company which I've been working on for over a decade with Venter, with Smith, with Kiernan. And, and I've been talking about this and talking about it and talking about it. And the first time I came here, I said, you know, someday we're going to be able to program cells. And that was a very distant dream. And then I came back a few years later and I said, look, isn't this exciting? And everybody here got very excited, like all of you. Right? Really exciting picture. Cost us $40 million. Took us five years. But that's the first time you take the entire gene code out of a cell, insert a completely new gene code, and create a different species, which was the world's first synthetic life form. And again, so what? Well, it was the science story of the year. So what? Well, the really important thing about this is the first computer programs, the first software chips, they didn't do very much. If you think of the first portable computers, about 1986, they weighed as much as a large suitcase, they were 64 KB, they had yellow letters, not that exciting. But it's the scaling on this stuff that's exciting. And, and the reason why this scaling is interesting is because if I take my mobile phone and I leave it next to my bed, I'm not gonna have a thousand mobile phones in the morning. But if I leave a bacteria next to my bed, I'm gonna have a billion bacteria in the morning. So this software makes its own hardware and that means it scales faster than Moore's Law. Let me say that again, it scales faster than Moore's Law. And that has been true for about the past four to five years. And what that means is you're building very, very large digital companies to triage the information coming out of life sciences. So it turns Amazon into a life science company, it turns Intel into a life science company, it turns Microsoft into a life science company, it turns IBM into a life science company. You're beginning to get these enormous companies that are trying to triage data that's coming in faster than Moore's Law, which means you can't build computers fast enough to store the information to process the information, to triage the information. You may be able to with quantum computing, but with today's computing curves, you can't catch up, which is really interesting. It's gonna to lead to a very interesting period. So what does it mean when software makes its own hardware? It means you can take these little tubes and take them into our greenhouse in La Jolla, and they expand, and then you put them into tubes, and you come back a few days later, and they expand. They do exactly what life does. Right? You plant seeds, you get big plants. You plant cell phones, not a good idea. Cell phone dies, right? So, so as this stuff scales, as this stuff grows, there's some really interesting questions. And now what we're doing is we're buying little pieces of the Imperial Valley in California, and they look like this. And those little ponds are gonna reach those mountains in the back. And of course the question then is, so what in the world are you making? What would you like us to make? These are programmable life forms. So you can program the apps in your cell phone to bring you love letters, to bring you spreadsheets, to bring you the daily news, to bring you photographs, to bring you films. As long as it's in ones and zeros, it really doesn't matter what's flowing through that cell phone. Cells are the same thing. If you program cells, they can make anything organic, right? Because they're just life forms that are programmed to make stuff. And as you're thinking about making stuff, these things can make almost anything you want. Now, this was theoretical when I started talking about it here. This was beginning to look somewhat real five, six years ago. 
it's moving pretty fast. You're going to see a reasonably large announcement reasonably soon from a little startup called Exxon. If I were in the energy business, I'd pay attention. And you should see that in the next, call it two months. And by the way, you'll see a bunch of other announcements with a bunch of other people. Because you can make protein. You can make oils. It means you no longer have to plant acres and acres and acres of palm to get palm oil. It means you no longer have to plant acres of soybeans to get protein. It means you no longer have to have refineries to make certain types of chemical derivatives. It means you can make the world's flu vaccine in a week instead of in a year. It means you can ship a vaccine as long as you have a mixture from New York to here and make it here and make it overnight. And by the way, again, this is no longer theoretical. We are now building and shipping desktop printers that program and make these cell constructions. So yes, you can try this at home. And this stuff is moving and it's scaling pretty quickly. We've now moved from desktop printers to articles that look like this. This is less than a year old. And in essence, what it means is you can give me a vial of the flu. We can run it against all known flu vaccines. We can run it against all known flus. We can look at bird flus. We can look at pig flus. We can look at animal flus. We can design a vaccine. And as we design that vaccine, ship it to an airplane that will print it on this machine before the airplane lands. So that's biology at the speed of light because you can print medicines while you're flying. And then you vaccinate everybody on the airplane. And then you vaccinate the people who guard the airplane when it lands. And then you vaccinate everybody on that military base. And then you send out the doctors and the first responders to take care of an epidemic. So you're going to be able to print life forms on demand. And as that stuff moves, you're also going to be able to print humans on demand, right? We do that with our teeth. We lose a tooth. We regrow it. We lose a tooth a second time. We don't regrow it. Unless if you're lawyers. <laughs> lawyers have extra teeth. But if you know how to make a tooth, why can't you do it a third time? You've done it twice, right? And, and if you can make a tooth, then, like Tony Atala is doing, why not make other body parts? And again, this was theoretical the first time I talked about it here. And then he implanted the first trachea. And then he implanted the first bladder. And then he implanted the first ear. And he's now working on 32 body parts, including very complex body parts. So in the same way as you remake your house, I need to change the windows, I need to change the fridge, I need to change the water heater. Well, you're going to regrow your knee. Why? Because every one of your cells knows how to make one knee and two knees. The entire program is inside your cells, and it's a matter of knowing how to operate that program, how to read that program, how to execute that program. But guess what? Your body knows how to do that. Your body knows how to make kidneys. Your body knows how to make stomachs. So in the same way as refur refurbish the old house, it's still the same house, but it's got new parts. And it shouldn't surprise us if over the next decade or two, we start regrowing many of our body parts. But if you can regrow your body parts and you're playing life as a game with multiple levels, why not think about editing those body parts? Because maybe the new body part, you want to be able to see an ultraviolet. Or maybe you want to see an infrared. Or maybe you want to have skin that's more resistant to radiation and doesn't get as much melanoma. So you don't necessarily have to copy exact. You can begin to edit. And you can use instruments like CRISPR to begin to edit. And it begins to give you control over what bodies look like. Because what you're doing is you're editing, altering, inserting, and deleting 
And maybe you're not just going to do that with body parts. Maybe you're going to start doing that with memories. Because it's not just the human genome we're decoding, we're also beginning to decode the brain. And we're the only species that thinks of how it's programmed, right? No other butterfly sits there and thinks, why am I programmed to migrate from here to here? There's no sheep that's sitting there saying, why am I programmed to like eating grass? But we really do think about, why are we programmed this way? Why do we feel this way? We go to the psychotherapist to get reprogrammed, right? So as we decode this programming, I'm writing a book on the brain with Ed Boyden, who works at MIT, and he's the guy who invented a science called optogenomics with Carl Deseroth. And, and what you can do with this stuff is you can insert viruses into each neuron. They're harmless viruses. You live with thousands of viruses every day. You're symbiotic with many viruses and bacteria. And these are, happen to be harmless viruses that take the fluorescence that you find out here in the ocean. So when you go in the ocean, sometimes at night, you move the water and it glows green. It's really beautiful. You take that fluorescence, you tie it to a virus, you put it inside a cell. When you do that and you activate it by light, you can fire neurons. When you can fire neurons, you control memory pathways. So you can begin to insert memories. You can begin to alter memories. You can begin to delete memories. You can incentivize smells. You can incentivize movement. You're taking some pretty fundamental aspects of humanity. And there might be one or two ethical moral implications to all this, which we might want to think about. Because this stuff matters, right? I mean, the reason why I'm spending the next 10 years thinking about this stuff is because it's about where genomics was circa 1990, where there were, the machines didn't exist, but the science was coming. And as the science comes, it changes whole systems, it changes countries, it changes religious systems, it changes ethics, it changes industrial centers, it changes every aspect of humanity as the digital revolution did, or as the Renaissance did, or as the discovery of some of the great astrolabs that were done in Cordova did a couple thousand years ago. We're also going to start thinking, and this is much farther out, about storing and reproducing the brain. And again, this is really early stuff, right? This is Margaret Lancaster building tiny little organoids in a dish. But it begins to give you a sense of, hmm, maybe. This could get really interesting, right? And, and as you begin to think about controlling memories, recording memories, storing memories, reproducing memories, editing memories, then you could probably someday store your memories. Maybe. It's going to depend on a very strange experiment. It's going to depend on being able to transfer a mouse head from this mouse to this mouse. And why is that such an interesting experiment? Because when they transplanted the first hearts, they brought in the wife of the donor, they brought in the daughter of the donor, and they said, do you recognize this woman? Do you feel anything for this woman? The answer was no. But we didn't know that, right? Because for thousands of years, I gave her my heart, she took my heart, she broke my heart. It's almost Valentine's Day. And, and, and so we didn't know that she didn't transplant emotion, that this was just a muscle. And, and now what we've learned is, okay, this is a muscle. There's no emotion transplant with it. So what happens with the transfer of the first mouse brain from this mouse to this mouse? Two options. Option number one, mouse is okay, but has no memories whatsoever. Huh, that's interesting. So where is memory? Where is consciousness? Where is all this stuff? Option number two, this mouse still loves mini mouse. This mouse still remembers what it's afraid of. This mouse still remembers how to navigate the maze. You can take a head from here and put it over here, and you can transplant memories. That is a big deal. 
Because then you begin to ask really strange questions like, huh, if I can take memories from here and put them over here, is the only input-output system a body? Or could the input-output system for a transplanted memory be something else? And then things get really amusing, right? Because if you can transplant memories, if you can transplant all kinds of stuff, then could you create a big brain? Could you share and meld memories from brains? Because if the information is transplantable in the same way as your pictures are transplantable from here to here, if your memories start becoming transplantable, there's some interesting stuff there. And what kind of nutcases are thinking about stuff like this? Well, here is your Center for Sensomodal Neuron Engineering, which is a curriculum for high school students. So it's the high school students who are going to bring together the digital world, the AI world, the biological world, and start thinking about building interesting stuff. And again, we're building an interesting company with this woman called Open Water, Mary Lou Jepson, who's beginning to think about what would happen if we could have a ski cap that would allow you to transmit your thoughts. We will be ready to talk about that in the next few months. Last point. This stuff is very scary to some people. Some people say, this is unnatural, this is dangerous, this is X, this is Y. We certainly have to consider the ethical, moral, legal implications of work that fundamentally alters life code. Why would anybody want to do this? Because at heart, we're explorers. At heart, this is a very cool planet. But it would be very cool to be able to explore other planets. And there's a small problem with space tourism. The heart becomes spherical. You start having heart attacks. You start losing your hearing. Your kidney stones become giant as your bones demineralize. Your cognition starts dropping because of high energy beams. Radiation is like taking a CT every five days. And 60% of astronauts lose their vision. And that's just a small catalog of what happens to you in space. Why? Because we're not adapted to space. Because there was no natural selection, evolutionary pressure to adapt to space. So if we are ever going to go explore these things seriously, it's really important that we redesign the human body. We don't even know if we can have babies on Mars, right? I mean, you go from one cell to 10 trillion cells in a cascade, and we don't know if that gravity is going to change the shape of a baby. So we have to take control over evolution to even begin to think about getting somewhere else. And why would we want to do that? Because you have to look at the single most important picture ever taken. There is no picture humans have ever taken that's as important as this picture. So this is the ultimate selfie, right? This is Voyager at six billion kilometers away. It turns around and it focuses on us. And that little white dot right there, that's all of us. Every single person that lives and has ever lived lives in that little white dot. And nasty things happen to little white dots in the universe. Because of meteorites, because of superplasma explosions, because of cosmic rays, because of X, because of Y, because galaxies merge. If you believe in human rights, you want to get humanity off that little white dot. In fact, you want to get humanity out of the solar system. Because that's the only way we survive long term. And there's no way we survive if we don't alter our bodies. Right? I mean, super volcanoes can take out that white dot. Maybe even elections can take out that little white dot. But hey. And as you design an interplanetary species, 
That's where things get exciting. That's when you begin to explore not the solar system, but this. And that would be a very, very cool thing for humans to do. Thank you very much.